Hello and welcome to an all-new episode of Anime Brain Freeze. We are your hosts, desperately clawing our way out of the cardboard rabbit hole. I am John. And I'm CC. And when there's just too much cool anime to watch, we got you covered. Season finale time, everybody. And that can only mean one thing. In the final segment of this episode, we will tell you our personal picks for best anime of the season. But before that, we have one final series to review... John's very own ball and chain, his baggage, his cross to bear for all eternity, or at least as long as Riki Kawahara keeps on writing it, and they keep on turning it into anime. Of course, I'm talking about the new season of Sword Art Online. Or rather, the first part of the new season of Sword Art Online, because there's more to come. Oh goody! Yeah, I, I can't wait to talk about it again in six months, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Look Mr. forward to that! Jeff Thu, if you're out there, Mr. Anime Pope, I feel your pain. <laughs> Don't we all at this point? But before we dive into that particular trash pile, we'll take a look at all the shows that couldn't hold our interest long enough to merit a full review in the Chop and Drop. Alright, yeah, Chop and Drop. Uh... We checked out a bunch of shows in the sneak peek in winter, and uh, not all of those shows made it <laughs> into our final re review selection, uh, because we didn't stink, stick with all of them, so we'll just quickly talk about why those didn't make it. And uh, I think I'm going to start this time, because I, got, I checked out a bunch more shows, uh, or checked out and dropped a bunch more shows than John did. Uh, so yeah, first series is Wise, not really worth mentioning because I already said in the sneak peek that even though I'm always interested in smoldering train wrecks, this particular one we already got uh, uh, in an earlier season in the form of its prequel series, Handshakers. I still can't believe it's a sequel. I still can't. You're saying that to me? I've read it, I've seen it, I still can't believe it. <laughs> neither could I, neither could anyone else. Like this fucking sneak sequel that nobody expected of a show, nobody wanted a sequel to what everyone was clamoring for yeah totally oh uh, wait and boy it did it really did look and feel like handshakers all over again and i didn't feel like subjecting myself to that all over again to another iteration of that so yeah i dropped it like a hot potato and yeah pretty much <laughs> that's my two cents on that i also instantly noped out uh, out of uh, kimo rikusa uh because Shitty CG, nothing will make it easier for me to drop a show with extreme prejudice. And same goes for the Magnificent Kotobuki that, uh, you know, as I've detailed in your review of it, I did not like their artistic choice when it came to integrating the CG into that show. If you can call it that. Yeah, you, you know, <laughs> I'm being nice. <laughs> okay, all right. For fair. a change. Uh, but yeah, I... It sounded, and you know, story-wise, judging from your words on it, it sounded like I didn't miss too much there, except I mean, for great dogfights. Yeah, I mean, the story was a fucking mess. <laughs> there you go. Uh, another one I think you also knocked out of was The Price of Smiles. Oh, yeah. Oh, jeez. I got like maybe five, six episodes in thinking like, okay... When does when does it get interesting? Never. All right, <laughs> bye. <laughs> because I, the, the whole conceit of it was, you know, what, what was the princess's name? Yuki, I guess, and the oh, other forgot. girl from the other military faction. Th that was supposed to be the conceit of the story. And in the first five, six episodes, that never happens. And I'm like, you're pushing towards this plot point, and you're not getting there, and you're making me say I don't care. Mm. Yeah. I, I'm not surprised uh, in general, like from the first episode on, the, like this, the fluffy Moe princess didn't really gel with the serious war setting they tried to establish in that show, at least not for me. And I didn't hear great things about where it went. Um, so. Hey, did you know war is bad? Yeah. Well, thanks. I've watched enough Gundam to know. Uh, also, I'm German, and we get that pounded into our little hats uh, from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, history! <laughs> Rightfully so. So, yeah. Uh, 
but uh yeah that that thing couldn't hold my interest uh, i just think i stayed for it not even as long as you'd like for two episodes or something and that was that yeah so yeah there you go i talked about dog fights earlier so let's get back to that uh, <laughs> girly air force um to my surprise this was actually a show i stuck with for a while Granted, AI fighter jets that have robot girl avatar bodies didn't sound really promising. Kind of bad harem show, maybe. But I like the main two characters. The AI uh, Grippin and the boy she falls in love with, Kay, who is then recruited to help her overcome her problems with taking flight and all of that. Learning to live a proper life, a normal life, kind of, as a kind of human being. And in the beginning, the developing relationship between those two was pretty sweet and funny and their first joint battle was real was like a real kick-ass moment the dogfighting in the show was pretty great in general i don't know if it was as good as magnificent kotobuki because i didn't watch that show but yeah. it was it, it was nice it was nice uh, and the mystery behind the attacking force of the zai was interesting uh, some of the side characters were neat I, so i thought i'd actually you know might see this one through but then, a couple of episodes in, the two other plain AIs that would become part of Grippin's unit enter the picture, and... Boy, never has a character made me hit the eject button so fast as did Eagle, who is like this stereotypical, blonde, bubbly, loud, grating, giant-boobed American girl kinda that is constantly running around, yelling at the top of her lungs, has the IQ of a chestnut, and wants to fuck the guy who invented her and the other AIs. So yes, she basically wants to fuck her dad, and yeah... She has mm -hmm. nothing worthwhile to contribute to the plot. She's only in the story for viewers who, like, I don't know, maybe want to imagine themselves fucking a mentally challenged person with an innocent childlike demeanor <laughs> and big tits. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but that is definitely not my fetish. And I couldn't tolerate her existence more than two episodes. So pass on that at that point. Which is a shame, because, like I said, the rest of the show had some potential. Like, I like what I saw in the beginning, but... That that girl ruined it for me. It was I, no, <laughs> sorry, that show just got too too pandering for me. So anyway, yeah, <laughs> bye bye girly Air Force. Also bye bye Boogie Pop and others, which looked interesting with all the you know mysteries it set up. But I was just not in the mood for like a con complicated, convoluted mystery box uh, at uh, that point or in this season. I think I guess. And maybe I harbored some resentment towards it because this is the show that kept Shingo Natsume from directing season two of One Punch Man. I don't know. <laughs> so, not a fan. <laughs> or at least yeah. not interested enough to keep on watching. I mean, what I saw looked interesting, but I didn't. I just didn't go back to it. That's fair. That's fair. So, what's another show that you checked out, John? And drop. Uh, another show I checked out was Magical Girl Spec Ops Asuka. Yeah, same for me. Ow, the edge. <laughs> it it cuts that, that is, it cuts so deep. That is my three word review of Magical Girl Spec Ops Asuka. Mm. And you know, it's really unfortunate when your show has the acronyms MGS in it in that order because, you know, it gives me hope. It gives, it gives me just a little bit of hope for this world. Now this show is a dumpster fire. Mm. I it was trying I, I know I've said it before and I'm gonna keep saying it. It just it was so up its own ass with how edgy it wanted to be. It's like, oh, these girls have been on the battlefield and and you know what show did that better? A little show called Yuki Yuna is a Hero. That show is depressing as hell, but it makes you sort of see like the grim realities of you know of, you know, the whole magical girl angle, because it, 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 I sort of feel like it tackled the same subject matter in a better way than this did. And it had more interesting characters and a better setup where the characters were like in service of this, uh, spirit that was protecting the world. And, you know, they were at its beck and call. So it was, it was better set up, more interesting, better character designs and animation. I was about <laughs> to say, Yuki Yuna probably has better production values as well. <laughs> Yes, so don't watch Asuka, watch Yuki Yuna. Yeah. What's your next drop? Well, 
you know, I also dropped Asuka uh, because, I mean, in the beginning, it's like, yes, this is outrageous. Uh, this this seems like a really, maybe a really good bad show, as in so bad that it's funny. And, I ca- you know, the fucking fountains of blood in the first episode had me intrigued. It was like, hey, this could be fun to watch. But then, you know, I didn't watch like the watched like two episodes and didn't watch the third and four four and then i heard things like oh now they're, they're really trying to go the serious route and trying to take this seriously and i was like yeah i that's not what i want from this a bit much i just want this to go over the top and be super dumb and and crazy and you know and not try to be too depressing and everything because the way the show looks and with the setup and everything that that wouldn't work for me so that's that. Um, the last show I dropped is um, Grimm's Notes, the animation, which I also stuck with for a while. Uh, I like the idea of going through all these weird gamified versions of classic fairy tales. And if you know these stories, they put some nice spins on them. We have the Cinderella storyline in there. We have uh, stuff like Don Quixote and, and, and stories like that. And yeah, it's interesting enough. There was a cool setup, I thought, for the villain Loki, who seemingly only enabled the fairy tale characters to escape their pre written destiny, which on the surface seemed kind of noble since the stories in this world constantly repeat themselves, uh, play out all over and over again, because that's how the original storyteller in this, in this, in this world wrote them. And considering how some of those tales go, that kind of imprisons the main characters of those tales. In literal hell loops, <laughs> because some of those fairy tales are really dark and there are really bad things happening to those characters or the people they love or whatever. So him basically enabling them, giving them the power or people around them the power to free them from those chains was kind of like, hey, wait, is he the secret good guy of this? Or does he just do this because he likes to create chaos? So that, had, you know, that sounded interesting. I, I would have liked to see where, where they would go with this. But a lot of the story beats were just too basic and the main characters were fun. But even after a couple of episodes, the show hadn't done anything interesting with them in terms of character development. So I just kind of lost the drive to keep up with that show. And yeah, I might have, I might be missing out on something. Again, definitely some potential. And if you're a fairy tale nut, the actual ones, not the anime by the same name, you, you might like it. But for me, it just wasn't enough to keep it around. It's probably more in service of the people who play the mobile game, to be honest. I guess, or it's created as an entry point to the game or something. Mm. Like I said, some interesting stuff in there, definitely more interesting for some people than for others, I guess, but just not enough for the main, with the main characters for me. I, I needed something to latch onto there, and there was just nothing there uh, mm. to the point I watched. So, yeah. Kind of, sh- kind, kind of a shame, but there were enough other interesting shows this season, so I don't feel too bad. John, do you have, uh, you have one more? I think. Yes, it was uh, Bermuda Triangle, colorful pastel. Oh, that one. Yeah, uh, I was initially interested in this because it was animated by Seven Arcs Pictures, and I like the work they do because some of their, the other body of their work is one of my favorite. Magical girl animal of all time, Lyrical Nanoha, mm-hmm. which has kind of been usurped in recent years by Simfo Gear, but that's a discussion for another day. <laughs> that so might come was... sooner than later. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you know, so, you know, I'll see what Seven Arcs is doing because I haven't watched any of their stuff in a while. Oh, no. <laughs> it, it is not their best work by a long shot. Apparently, it's also like a spinoff of Card Fight Vanguard, I guess. I don't know. It was weird. It wasn't very good. It, it was about like mermaids living in the ocean, and it's supposed to be this like mystical, magical, everyday adventure sort of thing. It wasn't very good. So I just kind of pushed it aside and I left it at that. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you're good, sometimes you're not. I guess that's pretty much it for the drops. Yes. So let's move. It's time. It's time. Let's move over to a show that we should probably have dropped after its first season or during its first season. But for some reason, we did not. I don't know what's wrong with me. It's it's, it's not me. It's the world. (laughs) The anime is wrong. 
<laughs> anime was a mistake, and we will prove that to you in our next review. It's that time. It's always that time, isn't it? Once again, again and again. Sword Art Online Alicization. It is the third season of the show, and I have kind of resigned myself to this fate of I I have to know what happens next. Because I, I was saying this to a mutual friend of ours the other day. I want my distaste of Sword Art to be informed. I don't want to say... A sword art sucks. No, I want to know why it's bad. So, what is Alicization about? Good question, so, actually. <laughs> a very good question, but I will I will do my best to line out the basic overview, and then we can just tear into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, before I go ahead, do we give a sh- do we give a shit about spoilers for this? No, I'd say this is a continued serious review. I mean, you have talked about the basic setup for SAO in your review of uh, the movie Ordinal Scale. So I think yeah. we got that covered. If, yeah, if... so I wasn't going to talk about that. I meant like for this series, this season in particular. Yeah, yeah. So consider this like, okay, this is a continued season review. And since and what we do with those or have done since like two seasons or something is just go full spoiler and if you want to know the basic setup of the any given series, just go to the first review we did of that show where we don't spoil anything. And that would be the review of uh, On a Scale, which John did uh, on one of our episodes, which I don't have at hand at the moment, but it's out there. <laughs> so just go to our review index and search it if you are interested in Sword Art Online and uh, just want to know the basics and don't want to don't wanna be spoiled yet. Yes, so welcome to the Alicization Spoiler Cast. We are your hosts. Get ready. Yep. So, <clears throat> in June 2026, our favorite hero of all time, Kazuto Kirigaya. That's not my favorite hero. Sh- shut up. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he was Kawahara awesome. commands it. Yes, listen to Kawahara. He doesn't know how to write women who don't love Kirito. Oh, my fucking... Kazuto, or as he's more known in the game world, Kirito, uh, was offered a job at a private enterprise called Wrath uh, by one of the... Is is Kikuoka one of the higher-ups? They really don't sort of line that out, do they? I think he is. I mean, he's he's at least a brain behind this whole operation, so it seems like he'd have an important position. Uh-uh. Well, uh, nonetheless, Seijiro Kikuoka, he's uh, like one of the members of uh, the VR crimes division, where his standing is in the company, I guess, doesn't really matter. Then. Mm-hmm. But uh, he had been cooperating with Kazuto ever since the end of the whole big SAO incident in season one. There's your callback. Mm-hmm. Um, so this job that he was hired for was to test out a fourth generational full dive machine called the Soul Translator, which runs on completely different principles than the full dive machines before it. Okay, we're going to take a sidetrack here and talk about that before I keep going. So the Soul Translator basically, it's the most unscientific name, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like, let's be real. Um, it's basically about digitizing a person's, like, memories and personality and experiences into, like, an AI construct known as a fluctolite. Yeah. So, Which is basically, pre- like, if you want to go spiritual, it's, it's supposed to be the soul of a person in digitized form. <laughs> yeah, it's... The accumulation of-, of everything they are. There's a lot of pseudo, pseudo magic science going on here, mm-hmm. but lots of techno babble. I did a little bit of reading. You might find this hard to believe, but you know, obviously, flux lights and soul translator. That's all. That's all dumb bullshit that doesn't actually exist. This sort of ties into something called quantum brain dynamics. So we're gonna have to get a little scientific and go down a little bit of a rabbit hole to see if I can explain. See if I can try and get inside of Kawahara's headspace a little bit. A rabbit hole, you say? Oh yes, that's I, I didn't 
That is the double entendre. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, quantum brain dynamics are basically just, you know, this general theory of uh, waves within and between brain cells uh, to show possible mechanisms of memory storage and retrieval, which is basically what soul transfer is. Mm -hmm. um, that by these two scientists, uh, Ricciardi and Umezawa, um, and it ties in with these. Uh, this basically theoretical particle called a Nambu Goldstone boson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and these bosons, uh, bosons basically uh, deal with, um, again, quantum, quantum physics and whatnot. Uh, and they transform non-linearly under the action of like different uh, uh, external stimuli. And it's a uh, weird horseshit that, like I said, kind of, has roots in science that aren't really reflected in sort art at all. So it's like, no. <laughs> so Kawahara kind of looked at it. It's like, Hey, I like that idea. And he took it at like the most surface level. And it drills down even further to stuff that like this, like Bardeen Cooper Schrafer theory that deals with like, uh, the interactions between nucleons and atomic nuclei and nuclear physics and fuck. <laughs> just fuck. But I just, I, I started reading about this a little bit and I was like, all right, you know what? I guess I kind of see that you're trying to do something, something. Kawara was definitely, with this one, he was definitely going out of his comfort zone. I feel like this is the most ambitious season of sword art Yet, or the most ambitious story arc of uh, Sword Art Online, I mean, and which which really goes out of the of your standard, uh, you know, vid trapped in a video game setting, or let's say, transported into a video game setting. I mean, Kirito get basically still transported into a video game, but you know, a much more complex world, which is more like a second life experience than anything else. I mean, before we go any further, I want to say that this is my firm opinion. I don't know if you'd call this a pro or a con, but I firmly believe this is the isekai story that Kawahara wanted to write from the beginning. He just had to build up to it with all of the previous bullshit. Possibly. I don't know. But it definitely feels more like classic isekai -ish. If you want to, like, put all the si uh, stuff that happens on the side in brackets with, you know, we got a few episodes that... Has has the classic cast and everything, but those get tossed by the wayside pretty quickly. But everything that happens in in uh, what was it called Un Underworld, yes, yeah, everything that happens in Underworld in the world created by Wrath is very isekai ish, very mm -hmm. comparable to stuff like uh, that time I got reincarnated as a slime, um, Overlord, uh, and uh, Shield Hero. A lot of the same mechanics, or well. Not the same, but mechanics you would see in, uh, in, in uh, a JRPG and stuff like that. Uh, but still, it feels like a very complete world that is separated from the real world in a significant way. And the previous seasons of Sword Art Online didn't really feel like that. The first mm -hmm. season maybe the most because the characters had no way to escape to the outside world and you didn't really see what happened to them in the outside world. But the following seasons all had like real world experiences for the character and development in the real world they were switching constantly in between and that doesn't happen in this season and for many different reasons this feels like a separate life for kirito that he started living at some point and then mm. with the whole history for him there it's not like he got suddenly thrust into this world uh, world it's basically like he started his life over in this separate world which is interesting which is an interesting setup i gotta admit Re-Zero starting life over in a new world. Mm. Uh, so anyway, let's, uh, I've sidetracked us enough. Mm. So basically the job that uh, Kikuoka gives to Kirito is to test out this new full dive tech. But it, when he comes out of the full dive at the end of the test, his memories of, you know, being in this uh VR world, underworld, uh, are blocked as a security measure. Uh, 
Uh, but, you know, unknown to him, the company wasn't actually testing the machine itself, but creating a special type of AI for military use. Darn, how about that? Who would have seen that coming? Yeah, who would have guessed? <sighs> so... There's a whole lot of dumb BS with that there where they had copied the soul of like a newborn baby into it as a template for creating new AI. It would be specialized. It would be nurtured in this specialized VR world where time flows a thousand times faster in the real world due to flocked flight acceleration. Breath basically brought Kirito into the world with his memories restricted to test why the residents of Underworld were unable to break any of the world's laws, basically. So I guess, you know, he was the control to see, you know, if he would be able to go outside the bounds of the rules of the game. That that comes into play, I feel, a bit more sooner rather than later, but, you know. Not only for him, but, you know, for another character in the story, one of the other main characters. Uh, he basically lived in this VR world for an accelerated 11 years uh, up until a point where his influence resulted in one of the residents, a girl named Alice. Hmm. Exce- also, also, sorry to interject here, but accelerated from an outside perspective. But to, right. him, it, but to him, it felt like he was living that life in real time. That's true. I did not specify that. But yes, uh, he meets... Uh, Two children in there, one named Yuji and another named Alice. Alice, by accident, breaks one of the rules of the taboo index Ooh, by accidentally having her hand cross the border into the dark territory. Yeah, in a very dumb scene. Yeah, an exceptionally dumb scene, much like the rest of this uh, season. Whoops, stumbled <laughs> like an idiot. So, uh, yeah... Um, Alice is taken away by what's called the Integrity Knights, and uh, we don't we don't know what happens to her because after that point, uh, the experiment is quote unquote concluded, and Kirito comes back to the real world, uh, with all of his memories blocked, like we said. Uh, he is escorting his girlfriend Asuna home. And then he's attacked by one of the member, one of the last remaining members of the Death Gun Clan, Johnny Black. During their scuffle, uh, Johnny Black, his real name Atsushi Kanamoto, manages to inject Kirito with the last syringe of the poison that was used during the Death Gun incident. I'm not even going to try and say the name of the drug, even though I have it written down here, mm. <laughs> which causes Kirito's heart to stop. And even though uh, doctors were able to restart his heart, Kirito suffered massive brain damage due to the lack of oxygen, and thus he ended up in a coma. And then Kirito's body was secretly spirited away by the Japanese Self-Defense Force and brought to a secret base in the middle of the Pacific Ocean where he was connected once again to one of the sole translators to treat his brain damage. He then woke up in the underworld, but with his memories of the real world still intact. And that's where we start. Holy shit. I want you to say something, anything before we go on. Like, What's your takeaway from this setup? Uh, I mean, we could have gotten there faster, kind of. <laughs> yeah. It's just like in the video game, best sword fighter. And you even fought in real life now in fucking ordinary skill. Like the whole movie was about you getting physical prowess to actually be good in an actual physical battle in real in the real world and then you can fan off a dude with a fucking syringe and you even have your he reaches behind his back for a sword that's not there yes it's so dumb it's so so dumb i am going to pose several questions to you moving forward because i just had a whole bunch i wanted to write down Mm. some that i feel like i have the answers for internally others that i don't and i just feel like posing to you first i might not either first question why the fuck didn't he smack the syringe out of johnny black's hand instead of stabbing his knee i don't fucking know like like he's 
Kirito is holding an umbrella with him, mm-hmm. and he uses the pointed top of the umbrella to jab Johnny Black in the knee instead of, I don't fucking know, uh, maybe using the hook end of the, you know, where the handle is to smack his hand and but, get rid but, of the syringe. But John, that's not what a sword would, would do. He must use it like a sword, otherwise it's not... <laughs> It's not his character. It's not what he does in the game. What? But what kind of sword technique is it where you go to s- stab someone in it? Not slice their knee out. Stab them in the. You would go for the chest or the neck or the head or the arm. Go for the arm. I don't know. It's contrived bullshit. No, no question about it. It's it's one of the dumbest ways to get like Kirito incapacitated. And mortally wounded, so to speak, and to force the story uh, or the plot to um, get him into Underworld again. And, like, turn that into the main, the main story at that point. Because he's put in a, in, a, in a coma and, you know, transferred into Underworld again uh, until they can figure out to... to what, are, what is their plan, anyway? How, how that, do was, they... that was my next question. <laughs> What the hell is actually going on to help facilitate his recovery? That yeah. We, we don't ever see that. We never we, see that. They never follow up on that, right? It's like, no. yeah, he, they, he's, they, they he's they safe stick him in now. They and say, fuck it. Yeah, they say he's safe now for some reason. I don't know how that stops the progression of the poison anyway, but he's safe <sighs> now, but they don't really explain. Is it just, okay, we gained time and now we can work on his recovery, but they never say how they plan to do that. It's just, hey, we need to get him in the VR world again. So yeah, it's <laughs> gotta get it's, back in the game. Get back in it's it's in the game. EA yeah. Sports, it's in the game. Yeah. <laughs> it's dumb. But you know, it's it's not dumber as other stuff we've seen in Sword Art Online before, so I don't know, it's pretty close. This yeah, this felt kinda like par for the course, I guess. But yeah. <sighs> just you know, I found the just the setup uh, with Underworld uh, the world itself I found interesting. Mm. And we'll get to why maybe a bit later yeah so going forth from there uh kirito is reunited with yujio uh, he's you know very unassuming young man he's tasked with having to chop down this demon tree that's sucking out the nutrients from the land all around it but it's like this hundreds of years long task it's basically his daily quest for the rest of his life also they're both uh both grown up now they're basically both the age kirito is when he is transferred to the world again i guess mm. like in real the, the, the age he is in real life which whatever that is but yeah uh what was after that i'm trying to remember when did they get the uh was it immediately after that they got the big badass sword? Oh, right. It was, um, I think it was Alice's uh, sister, Selka, disappears. And they go to find her in uh, what's called the End Mountains. Good name. Uh, which was basically <laughs> the basically the whole impetus for how what happened with um, Alice. Because, yeah, that was where, you know, the whole thing happened with... Uh, Alice got taken away by, or, you know, let her hand fall like one pinky into the territory of darkness and then got taken away. Oops. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, and there, uh, Kirito and Yu-Gi-Oh help uh, Selka. Uh, she uses her magic to heal them. Uh, they fight they, off goblins or something, right? Yeah, they, they fight off goblins. Yeah. They, ha- they find this sword there, but, you know, they're like, hey, uh, we can't use this. There's like this ob- object authority parameter, which is the whole video game part of it, which I guess makes sense because, you know, hey, you can't use a sword if you're not proficient in it. And this is the way it's gamified. So you have to practice with it to get good. Who would have thought? And that doesn't only account for, for swords in this world. Oh, no, no. This guy accounts for a lot of items. Like basically every item has a level and... An item level, basically, and if your level is high enough, you can use it, uh, even destroy it. If it's not, I don't even know how you overcome that, uh, how you can level up yourself, I guess, through training. Mm. Or, as we later see, uh, use another item with the same item level to, uh, against it, which uh, leads to an interesting thing, but I guess we'll get to that later. 
Yeah. So they train with this uh, sword, and they use it to fell the demon tree in uh, one swift swipe. Yay. Uh, so at that moment, Yu-Gi-Oh! and um, Kirito are allowed to select their next calling, and they decide to become, you know, swordsmen, and they depart for Central City, where they'll train to become, you know, actual sword wielders and find Alice and bring her back home. Everything's everything's looking good. They enlist uh, in an, at an academy. Yeah. For, for sword training. That... We're just like diving into other subgenres, like the whole battle academy mm. uh, subgenre that was real big for several years. <sighs> There's something for everyone in here. It's really like Kawahara just had like all of these ideas and was like, I'm going to do them all at once. <laughs> Asuna and Sukuha try to go uh, pay Kirito a visit at the hospital, but they find out that uh, Kikuoka has secretly transported him onto the JSDF ocean facility, the Ocean Turtle. And mm-hmm. uh, Friko Kojiro, who was one of uh, Kayaba Akihiko's uh, assistants and like his former lover, because we have to bring Akihiko back into it every fucking time somehow. Of course. Uh, she gains permission to go aboard with this, uh, and she basically sneaks Asuna aboard. She's disguised as this uh, woman named uh, Mayumi Reynolds. Oops, it wasn't this woman uh, named Mayumi Reynolds all along. It was actually Asuna. How did you, how do you let that happen? How do you not do a background check and find out, oh, this person doesn't exist? <sighs> There's other things like that that happen with Asuna later on that I will also get to. Uh, she's that, not in this in this season for long, really. So it's there that Kikuoka explains to Asuna and Rinko about uh, Kirito's brain damage and that they're using STL technology to restore it. Uh, and that the uh, and this is where he reveals that the main focus of Underworld is to create an uh, advanced AI. Uh, even though the experiment has proved successful, uh, they noted that by establishing the Church of Axiom inside Underworld, the AIs have managed to completely eliminate all kinds of transgressions, including murder, asterisk, from their community, and that they need someone with years of experience in VR, MMORPGs. God, that, that abbreviation is stupid. Like Kirito, to interact with them to develop the AIs further. That is the big aim of Project Alicization. There's your title drop. Which is which is formed by a pretty dumb acronym. Yeah. You know, Alice, which is also confusing because one of the characters is Alice, but <laughs> Alice is short for artificial labile. I don't know how to, even know how to pronounce this intelligent cybernate cybernated existence. Holy shit. Uh <laughs> I had to look it up because I, I didn't remember. Yeah. yeah I just what, I, o- I only had written down in my show notes, Alice is a dumb acronym. And I didn't write down what it was an acronym <laughs> for. I was like, okay, wait, let me look this up. Holy shit, yeah, it is a dumb acronym. <laughs> so basically it's just this big adaptive AI system that they keep hammering into the ground, blah de blah blah Yeah, uh, Kikuoka <laughs> says that... Uh, you know, all of his actions since the development of nerve of the nerve gear was to were to this end. So they, they really sort of start painting Kikuoka in a really villainous light pretty early on. Yeah, he's uh, he seems of questionable character. Like, but he, then they so, completely, you know, then that completely gets tossed by the white side for the rest of the season. So <laughs> see if, they, if they go anywhere with that in the next in the next part. Yeah, I mean, Asuna is like, I'll never forgive you, but I'm thankful for the days that I spent with Kirito in Aincrad. Fuck off. So it's been two years since Kirito, two years in um, the underworld, excuse me, sorry, since uh, Kirito and yuji left a uh, ruled village. And they are now the primary trainees of the North Centoria Imperial Swordmaster Academy. Why do these names got to be so long, Kawahara? Because it's a light novel. <laughs> um, 
they the two of them basically reflect on how they won a swordsmanship tournament in the northern town of Zakaria, and afterward gain the requirement to enroll into the academy. Their aim is to graduate from the academy as top students and stand a chance to become integrity knights. Bad goal. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Which means gaining access to the central cathedral. Again, all in service of trying to find Alice. Uh, her back to her family. Kirito has a, a training with one of his seniors, blah, 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 blah. She uh, is not important. No, she's not. A lot of characters in this show are not important. A no, there are they're a lot of, not. A lot of side characters, not even like outside all, you know, fucking Kirito's gang and everyone. Like, th those are just in one episode or something uh, or one or two and then you know they don't appear anymore but even in underworld there are a lot of characters that appear and are only here as plot devices nothing more no character development nothing interesting they don't appear outside of the fucking sword academy arc nothing of importance and are even you... in the arc that comes after that we have a bunch of characters who don't matter <laughs> It's... Are you are you telling me that uh, elite swordsman first seat Uolo Levantine isn't important? I don't even know who that is. I don't he, remember him. <laughs> he was the one where after Kirito gets his new sword, uh, he's training, and he like gets a stain on the guy's oh, jacket completely right. by accident, and he's like, oh. Your punishment, it, <clears throat> uh, my voice isn't posh stuff. <clears throat> Your punishment is to spa with me. <laughs> <laughs> right, that guy. Um, one of uh, Kirito's uh, seniors, Sertalina, uh, warns him that the uh, Levantine family power is that of imbuing the sword with the blood of their enemies. Blah, 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 blah. They fight, they fight. Guess who wins? It's Kirito. Mm, of course. Yuji and Kirito become elite students, and now one of the other elite students, Humber Zizek, mm. uh, challenges Yuji to a duel, ends up in a draw, blah, 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 blah. Uh, basically, two of the, I guess, the understudies of Yuji and Kirito, uh, Ranye and Tize, uh, you know, they start studying under them too, and they're both, you know, very sort of. Like, guess capable they don't really show them sword fighting a whole lot they they must have some sort of special talent in order to train under elite students like Yujio and kirito i guess it's all that's just the system of the of the sword academy right yeah if, yeah basically you know you, or you, if you, you, if you, you are, are someone's understudy yeah but but i don't think it's always talent sometimes you know as we can see with uh fucking humbert and reos uh, it's just about just, um societal standing like they come from good families and everything yeah so i think you know no matter it be a talent or a good family you got your way set out for you and then you become an understudy uh, understudy under one of the chief students and later become a chief student yourself and then you get an understudy and stuff like that yeah so yeah so this like you just pointed out this point so uh whom bears good best buddy rios and anton rios <laughs> and uh oh boy <sighs> Humer and Rios have it out for Yujio and Kirito and their big plan at getting back at Yujio and Kirito is to kidnap Ronye and Tize so you see this brings myself to my this, this brings me to my next question why is it always gotta have something about sexual assault ask Awahara not me <laughs> I mean, this this particular episode, we're like, I think, 11-ish episodes in at this point, 10, 10 or 11. This particular one was the most uncomfortable it's ever been in the whole fucking series. It's the yeah. worst. It's the absolute worst. And it's handled so badly. It's like, okay, we had the incredibly dumb, shitty, uncomfortable moment in a fairy dance where I forgot his name already, that captures uh, Asuna in a cage. Uh, and, whatever his name was, Oberon was his uh, yeah, yeah. handle. Exactly, the dumbass. And who then proceeds to, I don't know, lick her face and gets grabby and everything. And then <sighs> Kirito just uh, annihilates him <laughs> because that had to be in there for some reason because it's like, oh, this, this world is cruel and Kirito has no chance. Oh, wait, he can. He can just simply cut him down. And 
this scene this scene here kind of works the same way but it also serves as a motivation or it it, it it actually progresses the plot because this is a pivotal moment for Yujiro's character mm. where he overcomes the retri- restriction set up by the system. He basically, I don't know if he rewrites his own code or something like that, but it feels like that. Every time before he was going against this, this uh, what was it called, the codex? I don't oh, know, the, the, oh, the taboo index. The taboo index, right. The, the taboo index is like basically the set of rules that the, that the, AIs, the basically the beings in this world have to follow, have to obey. If they go against it, they either get right uh, transported to the whatever, get get collected by the Integrity Knights, or they get stopped with this system alert sign popping up in their eyes, and it paints them and stuff like that. And in this scene, Yuji goes beyond that, and his fucking eye explodes and everything. <laughs> it's it, it's a hard scene. But it's an important moment. It's not it like in Fairy Dance where that scene did not matter. That needed nothing in that happening in that scene had any merit, plot merit whatsoever. That, you know, no plot progression resulted from that. That was so unnecessary. This scene is also unnecessary in how it's pulled off, but it at least serves the purpose of showing you that people other, aside from Kirito, are able to overcome the, uh, the restrictions set by the system if their will is strong enough. Mm. And that becomes important again later with another character. And, you know, at least in that way, this scene has some merit. The way it's executed? No. Holy shit. It's not that this is a fucking vile, repulsing scene where, like, two underage girls are fucking assaulted by these buffoons. It's also... This scene is weirdly funny. While it shouldn't be, like, there's a scene where uh, where Humbert just throws away his fucking coat, twists around on his foot, and then jumps like a fucking, I don't know, cartoon comic book villain onto the bed with openly stretched arms and a smile on his face, like, here I come! And I'm just sitting there and going, what is going on? How tone deaf are you? What is happening here? <laughs> Such a lack of respect for this fucking subject matter that's going on in this scene. I was so baffled and confused by what was happening. I was speechless. This was fucking crazy. I cannot I cannot believe they did this in the way they did. <laughs> like, I mean, did holy Ka- shit. Kawahara out and said after the fact that he apologized to the actors for having to record this scene. Good. And then he also said, this is my next question. Why did you write something that you openly admit you were in- ashamed of or embarrassed about, Kawahara? I don't know. It's his go-to thing to make the main characters rage vo- vomit and, you know, overcome their their um, mental barriers. They did that before several times when not – well, they did – uh, threaten Asuna with rape, but you know, also her getting struck down uh, in in Sword Art season one that happened before and stuff like that. Girls putting in danger is one of the laziest plot devices, and Kawahara has done that several times because he probably has not a better idea how to how to progress his male characters. Just I, well, yeah. Sorry, I, I want to point out Sword Art Online as a franchise is now ten years old. When Kawahara started writing this, or, or when it started getting published, he was not a young man. He was 34. He is now 44 years old. So for him, so if the excuse is something like, oh, it was young juvenile writing, man, you're 10 years older than I am. Almost 10 <laughs> years older than me. I, I can tell you what you're writing is not a good look. No, not really. I mean, how old was he when he wrote this chapter of the story? I mean, I don't know when it was written, but you know, he, even even if like he, he probably was the age we are now when he wrote that is my assumption. If you start, he started writing that when he was thirty-four, maybe you know, third or fourth or fifth chapter, and I don't know, maybe some way, maybe maybe even even uh, older, maybe he he was already in his forties when he wrote that, and yeah, that's. That's like, I mean, I think it's really good that he recognizes that those story beats suck. 
But and, here's the thing. Is he going to act on that on his future works? Because everything he could be saying is just lip service. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've heard some things that, he, you know, he's actually, I think he's currently writing, uh, I don't know what it's what call, uh, it was called, Sword Art Online Progression or something. Uh, prog- yeah, I'm not sure. It prog- I don't, I know Progressive has been a thing. I don't what know is? exactly. I think it's supposed to be like a soft reboot, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I think so. I think it's a soft reboot, at least of the first story arc. And I think he's already like making better writing choices there. So it seems he has at least grown a bit as a, as an author, and I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt that he has recognized what the faults were in his other stories, mm. especially when it comes to writing female characters. Like I've seen, we have seen. You have mentioned one of his statements. He's done several statements where it's like, yeah, I I understand that people are unhappy with how I've written the female cast in this show, and I want to make I want to be better. I want to make that better. I'm willing to believe that he's going to try to do that. I don't know if he'll be able to. And up to this point in the show, he is not there yet. No. <laughs> Definitely not. Like, everything, every female character in this show, maybe Alice aside, is such a fucking either cliche or just a fucking plot device for our, for our male characters to progress somewhere. Nothing else. Like, nothing. <laughs> And that is embarrassing. Uh, yeah, it's like the, the fucking scene. What was that? I don't know at what point that happens, but there's a scene between Yujio and Tize, I think, and she asks him to marry her or something. I don't even know if it was her or if it was the other girl. There you go. But it's like she, want, she, she thanks him for his chivalry and something, and it's like this hyper wish fulfillment garbage again. And it's like, hey, if you are a nice person you will be rewarded with a nice girl. And it's like... <laughs> Foreshadowing. Yeah. It's not as bad in other parts of the show. It's not as insulting, not as offensive, and not as disturbing as in this particular moment, in this particular scene. But this is like a, the concentrated version of this. <laughs> it's like, what is this? Why did, it have, did this have to be in there? You could have done the stuff the progression of Yuji's character another way. This was so unnecessary. And I don't even remember when I've seen an anime being censored like the last time that way. And they did. They they put black bars over the most disturbing stuff. I mean... Or black shadows. Crunchyroll even put up a warning on this episode about violence and, uh, like, uh, you know, violence and sexual abuse. And it's like, oh, shit they've never they, yeah. they, i can't think of another show where they've ever done that i guess it, fucking hell i guess let's move on maybe i don't know yes it, it, after because after that scene i was just like oh well, let's okay good. let's aside from the from the rape rape thing ugh, that has to be in there apparently like i said yugio overcomes this actual barrier just overcomes his system default maybe <laughs> and manages to fucking cut down i don't know does he cut off ryo's hand right yes yes and then kirito kills humbert uh just fucking just just uh cuts off both arms of him he, they they duel and of course kirito just fucking whoops his ass and cuts off both of his arms which is a it's gross but it's a kind of cool scene I mean, he deserves it, but still, they didn't have to go to that length to make that character unsympathetic. He was an unsympathetic douche from the beginning, and I would have been down with Kirito cutting his arms off from the get-go. Uh, <laughs> God, his, his death rattle, though, was like... <sighs> it was also... It was so comical. It was just... No, the way this was set up, the way this was staged, this was the way this was presented, it was so fucking over the top, I could not take it seriously. Mm. It sh- it was super dark. It was gross. It was violent, but it was so fucking. It was so Deadpool. It was just so fucking. It was so comic booky, just from the sea where he jumps on the bed to that fucking ridiculous fight and his fucking grimmest face and everything. It was just. It was too comic booky for me. I could not take it seriously. But anyway, that happens. So naturally, that that doesn't is not taken to. Like, the, the other members of the Academy are not too fond of that. And also, uh, Yuji breaking the Taboo Index, I guess. Because killing is not okay, but rape is fine. 
And you know, the rule set in this show, is, in this fucking world, is not is not really consistent. Like, no, I think, it's not. What are the other things that are completely outlawed by the taboo endings? I think theft. Or there was something else ridiculous. But apparently sexual assault is okay because Humber and Ryos would have gotten away Scott's free. They were totally fine that they were not uh, threatened by the taboo index in any way f for doing what they did to the girls. It was all just fine. Yeah, uh, and they were doing it to other girls too. So yeah. Rondia and Tizé weren't an isolated incident. There was another girl, I think, Frenica, I think her name was. They were uh, fucking bothering too. It's like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the index was partially changed and rewritten by the main villain of the show, and she's a fucking sociopath, psychopath, whatever you want to call it. I don't know which is the more fitting term. So maybe that was her sense of humor. I don't know, but <laughs> I kind of doubt it <sighs> because it doesn't also really match her intention either. But yeah, still, it's like, what? Why? This is not consistent at all. <laughs> yeah, again, I... I probably rather uh, contribute this to a shitty writing than to anything else. Yeah. But anyway, that happens. And then, of course... They get taken away by... Who else? Alice. Integrity Knight. Oh, Alice, right. Yeah, she's the Integrity, uh, integrity Knight that takes them away. Yep. Uh, Shock faces on both guys. <laughs> the boys get jailed in Central Cathedral, but uh, Alice doesn't recognize either of them because reasons... Uh, mm. Kirito and Yujiro break out from the prison, and uh, Alice... that's that's interesting. By the way, how they break out. Uh, yes. That's one of the things I really liked about the show because this this goes like again into the RPG mechanics of it all. After that, they don't really dive into that anymore that much. At least in the whole item level thing anymore. Yeah. But that was the most that was the most interesting part up to that point, like how they made that work. Because basically, they're the the chains. They are chained to the wall with have, have the same item level, so, so they just smash them against each other, and those chains like uh, chains like break each other because you know they have the same power level, I guess. And that was just interesting. This was just a little interesting tidbit of world building. It was like, ah, this is how this works. That is interesting. I actually like to play an RPG that works that way. So good on you, Sao. You did something interesting <laughs> that. That uh, got me interested in, to an idea of yours. So, there's that. Yeah, I mean... To I, see something positive in between. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, they don't really use it too much after no. that point. But it was, an, it was neat while it lasted. Yes. <laughs> um, so, Yujiro and Kirito, after escaping, faced off uh, against one of the Integrity Knights, Eldrie. Um, it turns out that Eldrie's... Uh, uh, sword is a divine weapon. Um, they Isn't every sword in this fucking show. <laughs> all the ones wielded by the Integrity Knights. <laughs> mm. um, they manage to jog Eldrie's memory of who he is, and it sort of starts to break uh, the control that, like the the control that's over him. Uh, spoilers: the Integrity Knights are brainwashed. Mm -hmm. Memories erased, and also yes. that's why Alice didn't recognize Yujiro and uh, Kirito. Yes, so uh, the 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 boys make a break for it, where they get led towards this uh, warp gate that takes them to this massive library, and it's basically the entirety of the cardinal system, and they meet you know the the head you know the the avatar of that system aptly named Cardinal. <laughs> uh, Cardinal brings to uh, the boy's attention that she has been fighting for 200 years against the master of the system, hereafter known as Administrator. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Pontifex Administrator. Yes. <laughs> uh, fucking hell. And, uh, you know, she's... she's basically been trying to find ways to overthrow the administrator's control in how to um, return the Integrity Knights back to their original state. So Cardinal allies with Kirito and Yu-Gi-Oh to defeat the administrator and get back Alice. And that's that's basically the setup for the rest of this season. It only took 13 episodes to get there. Yes, the rest of the season is basically... 
them going up the tower, fighting Integrity Night after Integrity Night. And yeah, <laughs> 10 <laughs> against the big bad, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I feel like a lot of a lot of that in between stuff isn't too important up and up until they get to where UGO fights with uh what's his name Berkuli? Yes. Uh yeah. Uh Berkuli Synthesis 1. Oh yes, by the way, all of the Integrity Knights are name synthesis number as in uh, I assume it's the order in which they were synthesized into yes, becoming Berkuli Integrity Knights. Yes, was the first one. Yes. Um, He's the head of the Integrity Knights. Yes, Berkuli is, you know, the big boss of the Integrity Knights. Uh, he faces off against Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, Yu-Gi-Oh uses his... Uh, oh, right. Cardinal gives, imbues Kirito and yu gi with the knowledge to basically uh, pull out their full strength with uh, their weapons and their abilities and whatnot. And I think it's called like a memory release or something. Yes. Uh, UTO uses his uh, Blue Rose Swords memory release to basically freeze Berkuli solid and uh, disable him. But their fight is kind of cut short when the Prime Senator Chudelkin appears and he has something to say and he petrifies Berkuli and captures Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, and I fucking hate Chudelkin. <laughs> Who doesn't? But at this point, I, I don't, maybe I've missed that you already mentioned that, but at this point they already fought like a bunch of Integrity Knights and also Alice. Yeah, that, that's true. I kind of uh, glazed over the fight with Alice because it's sort of, I guess if you can call it this, it's kind of a turning point, uh, at least for Alice anyway. Uh, yes. I, I feel like all of the previous uh, Integrity Knights up to that point are like, okay, whatever. Yeah, there's totally one not characters. Like, they try to do some stuff with, with some of them, but it doesn't really work. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter to you because these are completely new characters. You care don't care about them. Like, They're there was, too- uh, with, with Fanatio, I think her name was, was like, oh, I'm a woman, so you're holding back. It's like, no, I'm not. Because you're a woman, I'm not holding back. And it's like, ah. Again, inconsistent, because nothing in this world's le- world lets you assume that women are looked down upon. Like, in terms of standing, in terms of fighting prowess, whatever. Like, the leader of this fucking religion, or whatever it is, is a fucking woman. Like, <laughs> nothing... Nothing in the show makes sense or is consistent in any fucking way. Nope. Ah, anyway, th- those fights are just, you know, they don't they're, really they matter. Whatever. Like, they, they fight two lowly psychopaths and stuff like that. It's, it's dumb. The only thing that is in there is for the action. And granted, this is always the thing where Sword Art Online can shine the most and does so in this season again. Like, I think the fights in the show look fucking fantastic. Like, in... Ju- I thought they yes. felt a little more flat compared to the previous ones. You think? Yeah, I, I don't know. There, Maybe there in just, some parts, but there was just something about them that just didn't feel quite as. I, I don't. I don't know how to qualify it, but I don't know. Maybe you know they don't. Kirito doesn't fly anymore. <laughs> anymore <laughs> but no. But I think the the scenery is a bit more interesting and varied this time around. Yeah. Uh, not all of not all of the fighting stages, but some of them. And you got interesting special powers, and uh, you know the animation itself. I think is great. Maybe they feel more flat because you don't give a shit about any of the characters they're fighting, and they have not been built up properly. So if that an emotional were the case, flatness. if that were the case, I would have felt that way about the previous series too. I guess so. Yeah, I don't. I, I, well. I guess we we disagree on that though because uh, then though because I I really I really like again how the show looked in general like mm-hmm. I think this season was a one delivering their a game so to speak I don't know maybe it's because the show was also directed by someone different from the first two maybe. series as well I mean there's some drag here and there in terms of camera movement and everything but I feel like most of the fighting scenes are incredibly d- dynamic be it sometimes a bit too short. Like mm. They're very short, short bursts of action, and then the fight is over. Sometimes it's even just a few seconds, and the fight is over. 
and it feels like okay you could have done more with that and like i said the characters they're fighting against i don't give a have not been built up properly and it doesn't really matter they're just roadblocks yeah. and that's all they are like i said the animation is good the sound sound design is good like yoshikazu iwanawi added it again i mentioned him in the uh, in my uh, recently in my review of captain Tsubasa. uh he is responsible for the sound design in that and in planet with and in previous sort of online stuff like this is has this really nice crunchy sound design to it that has a lot of impact and does a lot with your subwoofer and everything. Mm. And yeah, that's again this, the the fights feel like to to me felt like uh, the moves in the fight felt like they had a lot of impact. And you know, it was fun to look at. I, I felt like the fights, even though a lot of them didn't mean anything <laughs> in an emotional <laughs> way, were fun to look at just from an action perspective. Yeah. If you yeah, maybe maybe there were some flat. I didn't really notice it that much, but yeah, I thought it was this was a good looking show just in terms of animation. It was a very dynamic thing. A lot of interesting face, you know, over the top uh, facial animation and stuff like that was in there too, which I also appreciated just in terms of actual moving faces. And yeah, I th- I thought this this show looked cool. Yeah. So there's that, you know, again, to balance all our our seething hatred <laughs> with, some, with some positivity here. But yeah, aside from that, these fights don't matter in the long run. It's just like, hey, here are these roadblocks. And then we get to Alice and both Yu-Gi-Oh! and um, Kirito Fighter trying to get her... What is their? Pl- They're trying to to attack her with something to get her memory back, right? I think. I think is, so. I don't. Um, you try. They they got like these two daggers, which they are supposed to use on um, right. Quinella, but they decide to use one of them on Alice so she can regain her memories. But it doesn't really work out. So uh, and they get like, what a big explosion happens, and then uh, Kirito and Alice get blasted out of the tower, and Yuju has to continue on his own, and then later find Perkuli. But yeah, then we got this, you know, we got a few scenes uh, with Kirito and Alice alone on the side of the building. Which is... Ah. What's wrong? Even now? by anime logic standards, even by Sword Art Online standards, the scene where Kirito pulls up Alice at the side of the wall with no support whatsoever. Yeah, good luck with that. Fucking ridiculous. <laughs> I was laughing so hard and I was like, that is not, come on, you might as well fly, dude. <laughs> just standing on that sword and just no, 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 no but it's whatsoever. Object, no, but it's object authority is higher than the walls. Of course, of course, of course, that's the reason for it. There aren't even any walls he can lay onto or, you know, not the way he's standing on the fucking sword. It makes no f- sense. There's no counterweight he could use to fucking pull Alice up, at least not without falling back uh, down himself. It makes no fucking sense. Mm. I mean, and that, anyway, that marks the turning point where Alice sort of sees, you know, hey, maybe, maybe what's going on here is wrong, and Kirito, you know, sort of brings her up to speed and said, and she yeah. she says to him in so many words, you know. If I find out you're lying, I'm going to fuck you up. <laughs> but she's willing to believe him. Like yeah, not, she... not right from the get-go. He needs to do some work to get her to see his point of view. But then she's like, yeah, maybe the uh, maybe administrator is not as good of a person as I think her to be. Yeah. And yeah. So the, the, the groundwork is laid out here for what the final confrontation might be. However... John already alluded to it. Um, Yu-Gi-Oh freezes Perkuli, but then Shudelkin appears, which is who is like this weird mix of you know you got you got a lot of references to fucking Alice in Wonderland in the show already, mm-hmm. but he's like basically a combination of Humpty Dumpty and the Red Queen. That's and the that's he, basically what he is. I don't know the way he appears and disappears too gives you some Cheshire Cat vibes. Yeah, he's a mix of several characters from Alice in Wonderland. Cheshire Cat too. Yeah, definitely. Like, at least those three characters are combined into that weird, creepy ass. He's I don't know. So fucking cartoony. Yeah, he is ca- in the worst way. I mean, the voice actor is having fun with it. I guess <laughs> good for him. Well, I mean, it's the same voice actor as uh, Okuyasu. So, yes, right. I didn't even I didn't even recognize that. Yeah, but that is Okuyasu. Uh, Okuyasu. Yes, and he yeah, knows how to having- ham it up. 
Yeah, he, and he's hamming it up. But again, doesn't really match with the rest of the things that are happening here because, mm-hmm. you know, kind of serious stuff and he's like this fucking alien factor that is like over the top ridiculous. You can't take him seriously. He is creepy in a way, but he's also like dumb and funny. So it doesn't really work out. Every time he's on screen, it's like, what is this? And everything he does, he does because he wants to fucking bang. Uh, oh my god! Pontifex Quinella and they, they, uh, they hammer home in this message about you know how love is you know you're supposed it's supposed to be this mutual feeling. It's not something that you earn. And then he says, give. then he says to Quinella, "Hey, if I off these guys, can I bone you? Yeah, sure. All right." And he's powered, <laughs> and he's powered by his libido to kill yeah. Yu-Gi-Oh! Alice in Kirito and it's like well, well, for, it. it's like shut up yeah. shut up well f- first which was also a scene I wasn't too happy with Kirito and, and Alice get back into the tower and ascend to the final level and then suddenly Yuji appears before them as a fucking integrity knight because why not because apparently he got swayed without much effort by a Quinella slash administrator to turn to her side Because she took advantage of his insecurities, whatever, and then offered him comfort. Um, I don't don't know if they actually did the deed, but yeah, it definitely looked like (laughs) like she was uh, was, um, giving him a good time. Why? And I I don't dislike you, Geo. I don't dislike you either. But why is he a fucking idiot? Yes. I mean, it should be obvious to him that all of the integrity knights are under some sort of control. And yet every step of the way, he's like, I won't forgive them. They're so evil and bad. And it's like, yeah. motherfucker, you let the same thing happen to you. Yeah. It's, it's really dumb. And you know, the way she manip- manipulates him and manages him to release his core protection and stuff like that so that she can, uh, access his, um, uh, or overwrite his memories and stuff like that is like, you shouldn't be that insecure about yourself anymore because you have progressed to a point where that is not really an issue anymore. So they basically just walk his character back to an earlier point of his development so that it makes sense that, uh, or it would make sense if he hadn't progressed to a point further than that, for Quinella to bewitch him. And that happens. I guess because he's still naive deep down, which doesn't really make sense in regards to what or what what he has done in the story so far. So yeah, <laughs> it's it was it was kind of irritating. I was like sitting there, why, what, why are you swayed by this? This should not be happening. This didn't make sense to me. Mm. So yeah, that's. That's pretty dumb. Uh, and yeah, he becomes an integrity knight and him and uh, Kirito have a brief skirmish. And then, yeah, it seems like he... I think he freezes both of them, if I'm not mistaken. Like, uh, Kirito, uh, Yujiro freezes both Kirito and Alice. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and just when it seems like, hey, Queen Anella has everything figured out, it turns out he actually has regained his consciousness because of a conversation and or the conversation with Kirito during the fight, or because only, maybe only because their manly swords clashed with each other. The, so, the confrontation between them just felt like, like so quick and dirty and done. Yeah, when from, yeah rushed, super rushed. When from what I heard and I've seen p- other people talk about, that scene is a lot more important and there's a lot more detail about it in the light novel. There's a lot more inner monologuing and it's just, you know, it's much more, much more in depth than it's not in the show, which I was watching. I was like, okay, all right. So this felt this whole becoming an integrity night and then immediately breaking the control felt like nothing. Yeah. It felt really rushed. If he got, like, whisked away at the beginning, like, after the first fight in the tower, and then, you know, the rest of the story story only happens with Kirito for a while, and then then he suddenly appears, Kirito thinks he's dead or something, then he appears before him, and they have, like, this one or two episode long confrontation where Kirito reminds him of who he is and stuff like that. That would have worked better. Mm. Like that? 
it doesn't work. It's no. too short. It's too rushed. It doesn't have any emotional impact. You don't believe for a second that he will stay like that. And yeah, he doesn't, of course, and wakes up from his uh, <laughs> from his mind swipe, uh, mind wipe, I guess, and regains his memories and then tries to stab Quinella slash administrator with the remaining dagger. But whoops! <laughs> for some reason, for some fucking reason, she is immune to iron swords. <sighs> I forgot that part. Thank you for reminding me. They can't harm her because she cheated the system, which is her thing, granted. So maybe one should have seen that coming. Uh, in general, I don't dislike, I just want to say that, I don't dislike an as administrator as a villain. Because, yeah, she's over the top. She's super evil and stuff like that. But I kind of... They're not trying to do more with that with her than that, and what they do with that, how they display how she's like this over the top, like evil asshole villain who's only out for himself. I feel that kind of worked for me that approach. Like she she is this she starts as I think as this normal like AI girl in this world. Yeah, and I don't exactly know how it happens, but she she becomes conscious of how the system of this world works and tr starts to manipulate it for her own gain. And when once she finds out that this world was created by another force on the outside world, you know, the programmers, she decides that she doesn't want to live her life cowering in fear of the quote-unquote gods on the other side and just does what she wants with that world. And she learns basically... <laughs> I don't know, to, to, to program her own world, like to code her own world and form it to her will. And I don't know exactly how it works, if she uses the Konami code or something, <laughs> but, but fucking uh, she up, up, down, downs her way to, to fucking success. And uh, yeah, basically at the last moment before she dies, she finds out how to basically rewrite her own program. And from that moment on, she is basically unstoppable and she can basically she can she learns how to rewrite the memories of of other people how to manipulate them that's when she, how she creates the integrity night she learns how to change the codex she learns how to basically form that world to her to her will and she wants to which is a thing that made me wonder why that we codec is codex is so weirdly inconsistent she wants to keep this world kind of peaceful she wants everything to follow her will and if someone has to die for her goal to uh you know be achieved then that person has to die she has no problem killing off lots of people she doesn't give a, give a shit about the people that live in this world but she doesn't want any she doesn't want to give them any reason for to maybe i don't know gang up against her and try to overthrow her she wants this world to be, a, on the, at least on the outside, on the surface, to be a happy world. So why the fuck would sexual assault not be outlawed by the fucking codex? Would, you, would, you would think that some people would be unhappy with that not being in there. No, it's fine, though. Don't worry about it. Obviously, That's, don't worry about it. Mm, I don't know, man. It's just... Ah, again, this, the writing in this show is, is very inconsistent. Um, why she got to be naked all the time? fan service i get like we talked about this and you said you know it's because she's it's probably because she's so powerful that she just doesn't give a shit yeah but i do it she really likes her body and it really rubs me the wrong way you know what other show did this Symfo gear where fine was like constantly naked and even there that rubbed me the wrong way and i love that show i mean the nakedness itself doesn't bother me that much and it, i i kind of feel like with fine too maybe I think it fits administrator's character in a way that it's like, hey, like you, like you said, she doesn't give a shit. And also she's using her sexuality a lot to, you know, sway people, to, uh, to bewitch them, to do their, her bidding and everything. And I guess that works. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm fine with it, but I can see how that's distracting. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's just a bunch of boobs flying around all the time during fights and it doesn't really make any sense from a from an actual battle point of view because she's as we later find out she is still vulnerable 
not against iron source, but you know, there are the materials in this world. Yeah. I don't know if she wasn't aware of that or if she's just so fucking overconfident that she doesn't didn't account for that. I was like, nothing can touch me, which makes her a bit dumb. But still, I think her attitude that shines through from the beginning is like it's it's kind of cliche, super villainish. Mm. But I just I like I don't know I like her confidence. It's it's she's a fun kind of villain for me. She's not like this bitter, weird villain with a convoluted as hell motivation that doesn't really pan out and that doesn't make sense. She's just this straightforward, evil, sadistic piece of shit asshole that you just want to see go down in flames spoiler she does uh, <laughs> no. or up in flames or up in flames makes more sense i guess mm. considering how that scene is staged but yeah it's it she she feels really straightforward to me which i appreciated considering how much nonsensical techno and lore bubble there is in this show it's funny that the villain for some reason is one of the most straightforward things in this just in terms of character motivation so I kind of I kind of I kind of appreciated her in that way but only in that way. As I, she she I mean she's an asshole. She's a piece of shit. But, you know, she's at least clear cut. So there's that. I still would like my villain uh, villains with understandable character motivation and some, you know, relatability which she has none of. But, you know, at least you can kind of see where she's coming from. And she's very She's very confident that, uh, that she can achieve it and keep her status and stuff like that. So it's all right. It's all right. I've seen worse villains. And I've seen certainly ver- worse villains in this show, uh, in this series. So Fair. there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, after all of that, mm-hmm. when all is said and done, um, Kikuoka somehow manages to contact Kiriko- Kirito directly and says, uh, you need to get Alice to the World's End Altar in the Dark Territory. And then he gets cut off because the Ocean Turtle is under attack and power is starting to go out on, across the facility. And, you know, the, the there's electricity surging and, you know, that might damage Kirito's flux delay because he's still stuck in Underworld. Oh, my fucking God. And at that point, Asuna decides it's a good idea to try and go in and save his boy toy. Flip the table. That's the end of the show until Battle for Underworld starts in October. Yay. I have my next question. Mm, Why is Asuna a fucking idiot? (laughs) While while she's on the ocean turtle, she dives into Alfheim to talk to the other girls and say, oh, this is what's going on. You mean to tell me that none of these other paramilitary pseudo-governmental agents on board this top secret facility aren't – fucking monitoring what she's doing and seeing that she doesn't communicate this very, very hush-hush, like, black ops information to people on the outside? Do you yeah. need to, for me to suspend my disbelief that hard? Apparently. It's just, it's like, yeah, why not? I mean, <sighs> the idea itself that they would invite her is already ridiculous, kind of like, or bring her onto the fucking ocean. The, fa- the fact that they wouldn't have thrown her off immediately after she falsified her identity. Yes, it's so weird. I don't even know. There's no reason why she's there. Also, <laughs> why also, she should be there. Also, why would she dive into VR at the last and worst possible moment? Yeah, it's... It's not really sure that she can help Kirito, and she puts herself in incredibly danger that is not... I mean, of course, she's going after the man she loves and everything, so that makes sense. But still, it's like, hey, we got a countdown here, and if Kirito is, you know, still in here, when the power is cut out, he's gonna die. So what do you think happens to you if you go in there now? (laughs) Just do that beforehand, but not when the time is literally running out. Mm. It's just... It's it's a bit too late. Hope for him to get out of there himself. Like, or fucking don't. You, uh, I mean, it's, it's going to work out. Of course it's going to work out. But it's still, it's a dumb choice. But can we, I still want to go back a bit, back into one, uh, Wonderland, no, into Underworld. <laughs> can we talk about how 
You know. Okay, the driving plot behind this whole fucking season is Kirito and Yujiro trying to get back Alice. Right. Alice is the most important thing, at least in Yujiro's life. Mm. Kirito has Asuna on the outside once he regains his memories and everything, and he's just in there basically to help Yujiro find Alice. It's not really about him and Alice anymore, really. At least from a story perspective. We all know there is some uh, sort of online writing stuff. I get to that. But just on a basic level, this is Yujiro's story, kind of. Right? right? Yeah. Yujiro and Alice's story. So my question to you is... Why is there no fucking interaction between Yujiro and Alice in the final chapter of this story? Like, there's no no relevant conversation between, no interaction between. There is no co- real goodbye between them. You know, at the end... Uh, it's, okay, we went full spoilers. Yujiro, of course, dies. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yujiro's fate is fucking predictable, not only from the OPs, but, yes, he had to die three times, actually. What the fuck? <laughs> So that Kirito can finally dual wield swords in this fucking season as well, because that's his fucking gimmick, and also increase his ever expanding harem, uh, now with Alice too, apparently. Because yeah, that's that's what it what he does. But he could at least there could have at least been a scene where Yujiro says goodbye to Alice and I know she's not the same Alice he knows because she lost her memories, but, you know, there could have been a touching scene where, I don't know, she he wants to give her her memories back and she denies it for some reason and says, no, keep that with you so you will always remember me even to death or something stupid like that. Do something heartfelt with that. Those two characters are the linchpin of your fucking story and they do nothing with it. He dies. He says goodbye to Kirito because they're the best buds and then he re- reunites with fucking version of of Alice that he remembers in the f- digital afterlife or whatever it is. <laughs> and meanwhile, on the sidelines, there's just the Integrity Night version of Alice not being considered at all anymore. And I was like, I was sitting there on the couch like, wait, that's it? That That's your culmination of the arc of those two characters? Are you shitting me? You can't be serious. I was waiting for... F- at least one emotional moment, like one genuine emotional moment between those two characters, a prolonged one at the ending, and I knew yu would be dying. And I was so sure the yep. final scene would be between not fucking Kirito and another person for once, but between at least the three of them for some reason. But no, we don't get that. We don't get that. I don't understand it, John. I don't understand why. Please explain it to me. How the fuck? That is that an oversight? Just... No. How do you no? How do you fucking leave out your most? How do you not finish up your most important character arc in this story? What's happening? I don't understand. Well, you see, it has to all be about your overpowered self-insert main character. I guess. Do you know what's funny? This kind of, this ties into my last question: Was Alice really worth saving? <sighs> Yeah, what's the whole story worth it? <laughs> Basically. Well, I mean, they it got them to destroy Admin, so there's that. Yeah, but then that, now Underworld is way worse off than it was before, because obviously the next plot beat is we have to go into the dark territory and kill everyone there because fucking reasons. Yeah. I mean, that's the question, right? The, this This world was under a systematic despotic control by a tyrant who just used different methods than brute force. So it is good that she is gone. The question is, what is the result from that? Is it more death and destruction, or will Kirito and the rest of the gang be able to just destroy whatever is in the dark territory before that can swap over the rest of the land? And I guess we'll see in the next season... But just as a cap-off point for this season, and I mean, I guess we'll maybe see in the next season if they do more with Alice, but that specific story beat between her and Yuji was, was, again, the setup for this whole fucking season. 24, 26, 25, 24. something like that. Tw- 24 episodes was fucking Yuji banding together with Kirito to get back his best friend. One of his best friends, Kirito being the other best friend. But two best friends banging together to get their other best friend back. 
and then you don't fucking give, give like the two characters who have the most important relationship in this fucking season a good closing out point of I don't know a moment of of catharsis a moment of payoff no nope. nothing no nope. you don't get shit you don't get a payoff fuck you I am I am floored that, that I, that's my take I don't know if I don't know if this this is the worst SAO has gotten writing wise but it's definitely the most disappointing for me because it's like I was waiting for something I was waiting for one little thing <laughs> that would like make me feel something in this show that was not confusion or or anger or well I like the fighting scenes I said that but <laughs> you know that that is something else that is not emotional enjoyment um mm-hmm. And the scene between Yuji and Kirti wasn't wasn't that great either. It was just some fucking flat sentiment like you love is love is something you don't seek out, it's something you give. I mean that's a nice that's a nice sentiment, but the way it was like brought across and everything, it didn't it didn't resonate, it didn't work. Platitudes, 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 platitudes. platitudes. Yes. Don't we love him? Uh no, this I this I cannot be. I, I still just like you, trap for eternity. I want to see what they do in the next season with Alice. I hope they do something with her besides her pining over Kirito. Then, which hasn't, granted, hasn't really I happened think, in this. It, I hope it doesn't happen. It didn't really happen in the season. It's not like the typical like. Oh, after a while, she she falls in love with Kirito. Everything that didn't really happen, or at least I didn't notice it. But still. The way this played out, now she's part of his harem too, so maybe she learned to love him as well. Who knows? Even though she lost her memories, because uh, she can, you know, once once his true persona shines through, she finally will rediscover her, her feelings that she already had as a child for him or something. What, some dumb bullshit. I liked some parts of this. I liked I liked some parts of the world building, some parts of the RPG mechanics. I liked, like you said, I liked Yu-Gi-Oh! most of the way in this, except for some of his, you know, dumb attitude towards Integrity Nice and some of his naivete. I liked Administrator as a villain, just in terms of how she was, her attitude, how she was constructed and everything, and how she, how she acted towards the other character. That was fine with me. Kirito is cardboard kun as usual. He... <laughs> He's barely any character in this as well, besides, you know, being Yuji's friend and being the guy who always wins, which is on par with the other seasons. And Alice, I, some parts I like, but still, they didn't really do enough with her so far to make her a, a, really a character at this point. They could have done that. They could have made an important, you know, created an important emotional scene. And I wonder if, I wonder if that is in the books. I wonder if Kawahaba wrote that. And for some reason, the people who adapted this into an anime decided, no, we don't need that moment or something like that. I don't know. I haven't read the, uh, the novels. I don't, I would, I would Ma- kind of hope so, but I hope so. Too. I, I wouldn't I ho- hold my breath. Yeah. That, that neither. <laughs> it's like, it really feels like suddenly in the last moment, they completely forgot about Alice as a character. <laughs> It's like, yeah, you should maybe insert her into that that scene there, that emotion, important emotional goodbye. Nope, fuck it. I don't get it. There's a lot about the show I don't get. Like, small aside, maybe I shouldn't even mention it, but that's also a thing that bugged me. Why, uh, in the final confrontation, suddenly Cardinal appears and helps the guys for a while, and then she sacrifices herself for no reason whatsoever. Mm Mm-hmm. Was that ever explained properly? Because I didn't understand it. What? Why did she do that? Not really. I guess to buy them time. I don't know. It was very much like the rest she of was this so show. Powerful. Very flimsy. Yeah, but she was so powerful. She was much, much more powerful than uh, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh and Kirito and Ellis combined. So she should have been able to just curb whoop stomp the floor Quinella. With... Stomp Quinella. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think if I'm not mistaken, that was her whole goal in life. That's what she created the daggers for. That's what she got Kirito and Yu-Gi-Oh on her side for. Everything was leading up to this, and then she just fucking gives up at some point. I don't, I don't know if it had something to do with the sword golem or something, and that being a creation of the souls of a bunch of humans, and she doesn't want to fight that or something like that. So, listen, that is dumb. <laughs> that is really dumb. That's like. 
what do you think happens if you give up? Like, Kirito and Yu-Gi-Oh! Oh have to fight that thing and destroy it. So if you don't do it, someone else will. So fucking do it yourself. The chances increase with... I don't... Mm. This show. This fucking show. Holy shit. I didn't want to get so angry about this show. Because I mostly laughed when I watched it. <laughs> I mostly just laughed in wild confusion and uh, bewilderment. And I was like, okay, I guess this is I guess this is happening now. Sure, why not? Listen, this is mind-blowing. It's okay. Because in three and a half months, the show will be back. Not only that. Not only that. But on the same day that the final episode aired, Bandai Namco announced Sword Art Online Alicization Lycoris. So you can... What is that? You can play through the adventures of Kirito and Underworld on your PS4, Xbox One, and Steam. I'd rather suffocate on a river <laughs> of shit. I think. It's... That doesn't sound pleasant, but it might be more pleasant than that. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you, Bandai Namco. Yes, thank you. You know what, though? them They found a market for these games, and it's given them the money and the motivation to localize other shit that normally wouldn't. So I guess, I guess in some okay. measure, we have Sword Art to thank for something. Wow. Because otherwise, we, we would probably... The last Tales game we got before all of the... Before this big localization spree started was Vesperia. We probably wouldn't have had anything after that. Are, are you saying we're going to end the Sword Art online review on a positive note, John? No. Because, <laughs> Al because Alicization is still a fucking mess. If there are people out there who enjoy this dreck, that's fine. Whatever you do, you. It's This show is... This whole franchise... It was so confused and meandering and weird and dumb. But it's here It's here to stay. It's here forever. It prints money. And in, in my opinion, it occasionally looks really good. So <laughs> there's that. Yay! If you wish to put yourself through Alicization, you can watch it on Crunchyroll. You can watch it on Funimation now. You can watch it on Hulu. Just don't complain to us that it's bad because we told you it was. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> yeah, uh, we could end on this, I guess. Those are nice, nice final words. But since this is the season finale, there is one thing left to do. Best of the season. So yeah, of course we have to choose the best anime of the season. All right, I went first on the chop and drop. John, why don't you go first on uh, best of the season? Well, I mean, there were so many great shows to choose from. I don't know how I could mob Psycho 100 too. <laughs> I'm so surprised. It's such an easy... Because, I mean... I drop. Well, I, I didn't drop as much stuff during the season that we're currently talking about. So much as I dropped during the the spring season, the shows that are currently airing. But between across all of the shows that I actually finished, Index Three, no, Kotobuki, no, <laughs> Sword Art, definitely no, <laughs> definitely most not no. Data Live, I mean, maybe it was at least enjoyable and it was better. It was slightly better than I was hoping. But I mean, Mob Psycho really stands head and shoulders above all the rest of those shows because. Several head and shoulders. Yes. I mean, because the, the continuation of the plots and the, and the meaningful beats and character development we got out of it, everything about it was so good. And I'm. <laughs> It's it's just it's great. Watch Mob Psycho. Just do it. If you haven't done it, you you've done yourself a disservice. So that is in no in no uncertain terms my pick. What is yours? Well, an opposite to what you experienced this season. Um, for me, there were just too many good shows. Ah! Oh. Welcome to first world anime problems. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Your host is CC. Uh, yeah, I... Man, 
This sucked. This was just... I mean, there are worse problems to have, I guess. But, man, yeah, I, I pretty much liked every show I reviewed this season, except for Sword Art Online. Yeah, I like the emotional, rewarding, very personal story of My Roommate is a Cat. I love the over-the-top shonen sports action nonsense of Captain Tsubasa. On the other end of the spectrum of sports anime, I also really appreciated the more relaxed tone and focus on well-written character development of Run with the Wind. I dug the optimistic fantasy utopia of that time I got reincarnated as a slime. And I, of course, was completely captivated by the thrilling cat and mouse game of Promised Neverland. And any single one of these shows could have easily grabbed the top spot in any season not so jam-packed with good stuff. Or rather, any season that didn't have Mob Psycho 100 in it. <laughs> <laughs> because, goddamn, what a show! What a season! Ah, funny, intelligent, creative, emotional. And what can you say about the mind-bending presentation that has not already been set? It is a fucking feast for the eyes, mm -hmm. for the ears, everything. From beginning to end, this is a masterpiece of a show. It's one of Bone's best... It deserves a place in the ranking of best anime of all time. And it most definitely deserves the title of best of the season on our little show. Most definitely. Yeah, like John said, uh, if you haven't yet, go watch it. Don't miss out on this. You do yourself a disservice. But also, yeah, definitely check out all the other shows I mentioned in this segment. At least one of them will probably be to your liking as well. This season really had a lot of varied stuff to offer that I love to watch and would love to see more of. And in at least the case of Promised Level Land, I will. So, yeah, good times for me more so than for John this season. Uh, I mean, I, I do plan on going back to watch um, Promised Neverland because I heard from so many people it's good. So I want to watch it. it. And it only gets better. I've heard so much good stuff about what happens in the manga currently, and everyone's like, I can't believe how good this is, what the fuck? So yeah, <laughs> really looking forward to that one, but that also means that's coming back. Mob Psycho 100, I'm not sure about, maybe for another season, but not much more, if at all. So this definitely, it, it must be the best of this season, because mm -hmm. it's so fucking good. But yeah, who knows? Uh, maybe next season, you know, this experience will be switched around again. As it tends to happen, maybe John has the better shows to talk about. I definitely have a, a couple that I'm not too fond of. I can already tell you that. Or at least one of them. Well, maybe two. We'll see. <laughs> but yeah, we'll, we'll take a break until all the premieres from summer season have aired. So yeah, look forward to the sneak peek of those shows uh, in our next episode in a couple of weeks. And of course, our first review for a series from spring this year. Until then, try not to get burned to a crisp in the cruel summer sun and see you guys next time. Stay hydrated. And that is a wrap on the 76th episode of Anime Brain Freeze. All the music in our shows from the Double Dragon Neon soundtrack by the amazing Jake Kaufman. Please go to vit.badcamp.com and check out his awesome work. Our show is available on most of the popular podcast services, but it's always worth visiting AnimeBrainFreeze.com for our review index and some interesting articles linked in our episode release posts. Leave us comments and questions on YouTube, follow us on Twitter at AnyBrainFreeze, or send an email to AnimeBrainFreeze at gmail.com. We would love to read your feedback. Thanks for tuning in, we hope you had a good time, and please join us again on our next episode. Macht's gut! Take care, everybody. Next time on Anime Brain Freeze. A classic 50-year-old tale reimagined. A story of two unlikely companions. And a quest to regain what is rightfully yours. Yeah.